started uh, doing something here in the last couple of weeks with um, Facebook Live. And so uh, just for the message, just for the sermon portion, we've got the uh, Facebook uh, Live going. And so I'm trying to set up the tripod in a place where it won't be distracting to any of you. So let me know if that tripod is in the way. And also for the viewers who are watching live, you can type in the comments if you think uh, we need to position that a little better for you. And it's been neat to see several people join us the last couple of weeks live, so that's been pretty cool. So we will uh, we'll continue to do that. This morning we're going to uh, open our Bibles to 2 Chronicles 28. 2 Chronicles 28. We've been looking at the kings of Judah in the Old Testament. And it has been an interesting study. We've seen some good kings, and we've seen some bad kings, and today we see one of the worst kings that uh, the southern kingdom of Judah ever had in its history. And so his name was Ahaz, and uh, he is, um, as I mentioned, one, one of the worst kings, but we can still learn a lot from this passage of Scripture, and uh, certainly uh, just a wake-up call in the morning to us today. So turn with me to 2 Chronicles 28. We're not going to read the entire chapter, but we're going to look at um, a summary of the chapter here this morning, starting in verse 1. 2 Chronicles 28, starting in verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do right in the sight of the Lord, as David his father had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and he also made molten images for the Baals. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, and burned his sons in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Wherefore, the Lord God, the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram. And they defeated him and carried him away, uh, a great number of captives, and brought them to Damascus. He was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. And then skip down to verse 16. Verse 16 says, At that time King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria for help. For again the Edomites had come and attacked Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the lowland and of the Negev and of Judah, and had taken Beth Shemesh and Ajon and Gerardo and Soko and its villages, Timnah with its villages, and Gibzo with its villages, and they settled there. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had brought about a lack of restraint in Judah, and was very unfaithful to the Lord. So tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him, instead of strengthening him. Although Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord, and out of the palace of the king, and of the princes, and gave it over to the king of Assyria, it did not help him. Now in the times of his distress, the same king Ahaz became more unfaithful to the Lord, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him. And he said, Because the gods of the kings of Aaron helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the downfall of him and all Israel. Moreover, when Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of the Lord, he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces, and closed the doors of the house of the Lord, and made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah he made high places to burn incense to other gods, and provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways, from first to last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city in Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel, but Hezekiah his son reigned in his place. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to this passage of Scripture, uh, Lord, we see some difficult things in, in these verses, in these pages of history. And Lord, help us to learn from history and to understand it isn't just something that happened in the past, but there's relevance to us today. Lord, we thank you. You are the living God, and, and you call us to you. You are a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. You're also a God who is holy and righteous and just, and you want us to walk in your ways. And so I, I pray that we would be saddened by what we read here, but that we would also be determined to live lives of faithfulness, and that we would follow a different course, and to serve you and love you with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength. 
And so guide us this morning as we work through these verses. Lord, reveal yourself to us and challenge us to live in a way that would bring glory and honor to your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have you ever driven through a, a, a neighborhood or a city or a part of town that once was very vibrant and, and beautiful, but over the years had just gone downhill and, and into decline? Think about a, a father who is excited to take his children to visit his hometown. They'd never been there before. It had been years since he had been back, and he has so many wonderful memories. He can't wait to share these experiences with his kids. He said, oh yeah, we lived in this great big white house. There's a beautiful flower garden out front, just the best neighborhood, wonderful neighbors, safe place to grow up. There was a, a park down the street we would ride our bikes to in the summer. There was a pizza place a block away that made the best pizza. I can't wait for you guys to see this. And maybe my neighbors still live there. I, I wonder if old Mr. Smith still lives in the big yellow house across the street. It's going to be great. So they jump in the car and they drive and he's telling them all kinds of stories about the good old days. And they finally roll into town, but when they get there, he can barely believe his eyes. He doesn't even recognize the place. Are, are we, maybe I took a wrong turn somewhere. But they pull into town and, and realize, wait a minute, no, I am in the right place. But it's so very different than I remember. His old childhood home is still there, but the windows are busted out, and it's boarded up, it's uninhabited, it's abandoned, and someone spray-painted graffiti <coughs> across the front door. The, the flower garden is full of weeds. There's trash in the streets. And he wonders, well, maybe Mr. Smith is still, oh, no, there's a great big no trespassing sign right there on the fence post. Guess he doesn't live there anymore. And that nice little park they used to walk to, there's some shady characters hanging out. Looks like a drug deal's going down. Let's not go there. The pizza place has been torn down. And there's a, um, a liquor store in its place. And the kids lock the doors in the car as they drive through the neighborhood. And they, they think, boy, our dad must be pretty tough to have grown up here. And, and his wife leans over and says, honey, thanks for sharing this with us. But I think everybody's scared. Can we go now? It doesn't take long for a, a neighborhood or a city or a town or a home to fall into decline. It just takes one generation of neglect. A few years of letting things slide. A, a lack of leadership. A, a loss of concern. And before long, the once beautiful place has fallen into ruin. And that's what happened here in the land of Judah during the reign of King Ahaz. It wasn't necessarily a physical decline with the streets and the buildings and, and the neighborhoods, but it was a spiritual decline that took place, leaving the nation an empty shell of what it had been. Jerusalem was to be the holy city, shining like a beacon of light in the world, but instead it became a terribly wicked place where idolatry was running rampant, and the law of God was ignored, and the morals of society were in the gutter. And out in front, leading the way, was the king. Our passage tells us he promoted wickedness. He led the people in sin. Verse 19 in the chapter summarizes his rule and says that, that the Lord humbled Judah because Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had, he had brought about a lack of restraint in Judah and was very unfaithful to the Lord. That, that phrase, lack of restraint, is used some 16 times in the Old Testament, and it means to, to let go, to cut loose, to run wild, to be out of control. It was the kind of society that, that Ahaz not only allowed, but promoted. They, they cast aside all moral restraints and plunged it ahead into their own self-destructive path. And the law of God was cast aside. The words of the prophets were ignored. Those were the, the guideposts that were to point the people to the right path. But they ignored them and went ahead along that self-destructive path. And when a society casts aside moral restraint, it isn't long before it heads into spiritual decline. And we see the disastrous consequences of that here in, in 2 Chronicles 28. And it warns us that, that it doesn't take long for a society to fall into ruin when it turns away from God. 
What about the world that we live in today? Are there any parallels to, to our societies? Well, there was a, a study done recently by, by Lifeway Research, and I'm just going to read a portion of the article, but it, it says that Americans worry about moral decline. And the article says, most older Americans say right and wrong never change. Younger Americans, not so much. A new study found significant, a significant generation gap in how Americans view morality. More than 6 in 10 of those older than 45 say right and wrong do not change. For those 35 and younger, fewer than 4 in 10 make the same claim. Now that's a huge change between generations, said Scott McClellan, the executive director of Lifeway Research. Older Americans grew up at a time when ideas about morality were stable, but that's no longer true. We're shifting very fast into a world where right and wrong are relative. It goes on and said that 81% that of Americans agree with the statement, I am concerned about the declining moral behavior in our nation. The study looked at factors that shape moral views. Among those influences, parents, 64%, religious beliefs, 50%, personal feelings, 42%, friends, 35%, teachers, 26%, in media, like books, movies, music, 14%, overall, Americans seem guided more by their internal moral compass than by laws. And it goes on, it says, those who attend religious services once or more a month say, say that faith has the biggest influence on their morals, as opposed to only 13% of those who attend less than once a month. It's an interesting article, and, and if you want to read more, I can give you the link to that. But, but you know, that's a, that's a serious thing. 81% say yes. Our world, our society is in moral decline. We see that. And that, that only includes those who go to church, those who do not go to church, those who believe, those who do not believe. We see the degradation of our society. We're going to look at some of the ways that we can measure a society's decline. We're going to look at, at the land of Judah as a case study. But first, we want to get some background on King Ahaz. Again, verse 1 says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not do right in the sight of the Lord, as David, his father, had done. Now, Ahaz ruled from around 735 to 715 B.C. And his reign lasted 16 years. He was the 11th king of Judah. His, his father's name was Jotham, and he's described in, in the previous chapter as someone who did right in the eyes of the Lord. And that's a troubling statement for us. How could someone who did right in the eyes of the Lord have a son who went so wrong in his life? And that's a pattern that we see emerge throughout the book. We see people like godly Jehoshaphat, who is succeeded by his wayward son, Jehoram. Or faithful Hezekiah, who left the kingdom to evil Manasseh. Or we'll see Josiah, who was committed to God's word, and he had a son, Jehoiakim, who burned the scrolls of, of God's word. And, and that reminds us there's no guarantee the next generation will share the same values or the same beliefs that we have. There's no guarantee, even if we go to church and, and we practice our faith, there's no guarantee the next generation will follow the same path. And that's why scripture urges us to take an active role in training up our children in the ways of the Lord. And even then, it's not automatic. It's something we need to pray for. And continue to reach out and minister. Ahaz ruled over the land during a time of, of conflict and war and unrest. The chapter describes some of those. The Assyrian Empire had, had grown powerful and was exerting control over the region. And there's a clay tablet that's on display in the British Museum. If you're ever in London, you can check it out. You can go there and see this artifact that comes from the days of Ahaz. And it talks about the conquests of Tiglath Pileser, the the king of Assyria, the nations that he conquered, and the tribute that they paid to him. And it mentions this king of Judah. And it's, it's really interesting. It talks about the gold, the silver, the linen garments that he handed over to the Assyrians. But at the same time, there were other nations that were opposing the Assyrians. There was an anti-Assyrian confederacy that was led by the northern kingdom of Israel and the, the nation of Aram. And they wanted Judah to, to come along and partner with them and and with, with, you know, facing off against the Assyrian Empire. But Ahaz did not. He refused. And because of that, the, the Arame Arameans and the, the uh, northern kingdom of Israel attacked Judah, and they tried to replace Ahaz as king. 
And they, they tried to invade Jerusalem, but they, they did not succeed. Instead of humbling himself before the Lord, Ahaz grew more and more unfaithful. He's one of the worst kings in the history of Judah. His unfaithfulness serves as a warning to future generations. Those who would read later on would look back and say, let us never again go down that road. And it also speaks to us. When a society casts off moral restraint and turns from the Lord, it's following a path to ruin. One example of a society in decline is that human life is no longer valued. Again, if we look at verses 2 and 3, the passage tells us that he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He made molten images for the Baals. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and burned his sons in the fire. According to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. Now, there were evil rulers before he came along, but he took it to a whole new level. Spiritual condition decayed to the point where child sacrifice became acceptable. Not just done in secret by a few, but done openly in public with the king participating. There were shrines to Baal and Moloch in, in the valley of ben Hinnom, just outside the walls of Jerusalem. There was a narrow gorge that, that curved to the west and southern sides of the city. It was a very unpleasant place. It was a place at one point that became a trash dump in the nation, and, and trash was burned, and there were fires and stench, and in the New Testament, the place is referred to as Gehenna, which is a picture of hell. But here in these days, the prophets called it the Valley of Slaughter, because there were so many innocent lives that were destroyed by those pagan rituals. Archaeologists have uncovered sites, not just in, in Judah and Israel, but also in other places, other na nations in the region, where these kinds of rituals were done. There's often a bronze statue of a figure holding out its, its arms, supposedly their deity, and the priest would take the child and place it in the hands of that statue, and the altar below would be lit, and the flames would consume the child. And that's revolting for us to think about. We can't help but wonder how could anyone take part in something so brutal and horrific. The heart of God was broken and overwhelmed with grief by these things. These, these were the kinds of abominations practiced by the Canaanites who dwelled in the land before them. And now they were doing the very same thing, even though they knew better. In Jeremiah 7, verses 30 and 32, God says, The people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable idols in a house that bears my name and have defiled it. They, they have built high places of Topheth in the valley of ben Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call it Topheth, or the valley of ben Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. The scripture teaches us about the sanctity of life, that every human being is valued, in the eyes of God, because we are made in God's image. And therefore, every life, no matter how big or how small, should be valued. When a society is built on godly ideals, then it will cherish and protect life. But when a society drifts away from God, it will abandon those convictions. It was hard for us not to see a parallel with the modern abortion industry in our world. The Christian author Ken Ham has, has some, some really powerful articles about that. I just want to read a section of one of his articles. He says, as we read of the abomination in Scripture, the so-called civilized West would claim that such vile behavior as child sacrifice should not be tolerated. But they do. It does occur in our Western nations. And in fact, the whole world. The abortion is, is not called child sacrifice. The victims are not called children. Different terms are used in an attempt to hide the reality of what is happening. A killing of human beings made in the image of God. He goes on, he says, since abortion was legalized in America, it is estimated that over 55 million children have been sacrificed. Now these are not easy words to hear, but Cam is, is telling the truth. Our society has lost its way. 
There, there are lies that are told by our culture about choice and freedom. That those lies have led to a tremendous amount of brokenness and heartache. But the church is called to affirm God's truth and to speak out. And it's also called to share the healing that's found in Jesus Christ. God values life so much that he entered our world to redeem us from sin. And he shows us there is mercy, and there is grace, and there is redemption in the Savior. But today it's not politically correct, maybe, to speak out against abortion. It might even be labeled by some as, as a hate group for doing so. But that couldn't be further from the truth. It isn't hate, it's love that moves us to defend the unborn. It's not enough just to oppose abortion, but we need to minister to families, to show them God's love, and again, to extend the healing and the redemption that is found in Christ. And so one example of, of a society in decline is one that no longer values human life. Another example of, of, a, of a society in decline is a lack of justice. If you skip down to verse, verses 8 through 10, the nation of Judah had been drawn into a series of conflicts, as I mentioned. There were wars, there were, uh, there were battles, and after, after some battles, people were, were captured. A great number of people were captured. Verse 8 tells us the sons of Israel carried away captive their brethren, 200,000 women, sons and daughters. And they, they took also a great deal of spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army which came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in a rage, which has even reached, it, reached heaven. Now you are proposing to subjugate for yourselves the people of Judah and Jerusalem for male and female slaves. Surely you do not have transgressions of your own against the Lord your God? Now in this instance, it wasn't the people of Judah who were in Imposing injustice, but injustice was, was being afflicted upon them. Many of their men, their women, and children were captured by the northern tribes of Israel, and they were being carried back to Samaria, where they would serve as slaves. That was pretty common in the ancient world, but it wasn't right. The, the defeated often took the, were often taken as the spoils of war by the conquerors, but but it wasn't right, especially when we consider these were their brethren, their flesh and blood. Even though they had broken apart in <coughs> separate nations, they were still the children of Jacob. God's people were to act differently from the rest of the world, <coughs> to live by a higher law. But they proved themselves to be just as ruthless and corrupt as anyone else. And this huge group of people, hundreds of thousands, would have been slaves if the prophet of God had not intervened, this prophet Oded, we, we don't read about anywhere else, but he emerges here and he speaks out. He stands in the road as this army is returning from battle back to Samaria. And he, and he confronts them. He says, how could you do this? How could you enslave your own brethren? Don't you remember your ancestors were slaves in Egypt? And now you're going to take your brothers and sisters and, and put them to forced labor? Your list of sins is already long enough. You want to add to that list? And amazingly, the soldiers listened to the prophet. And they set them free. They released them. They gave them food and clothing and allowed them to go home. It's pretty amazing when we think that the northern kingdom was usually more wicked than the southern kingdom. But here it was the northern kingdom that repented. And we might think that, that this event would cause the people of Judah to re-examine their conduct and take a look at how they were treating one another. But sadly, that wasn't the case. Injustice continued to run rampant in that society. The powerful continued to exploit the weak. Widows and orphans continued to be neglected. The rights of citizens continued to be trampled. Judges did not enforce the law, but continued to take bribes. It was the very opposite of how God wanted them to live. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 1, we read about that injustice. And God says, See how the faithful city has become a harlot. She was once full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her. But now they are murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. They love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not 
A justice is a word that we hear today. We use that word. It's, it's an important concept. It's an ideal in our modern society. But we realize there are times we have fallen short and continue to fall short. We're certainly blessed to live in this country compared to other parts of the world. But even here, we're not surprised when we hear stories about corruption or we, when we read about failures of the justice system, when celebrities are treated differently than normal people. Sometimes we become discouraged. We feel powerless to fix what is broken in society. But there is much we can do to make a difference. We can show compassion to those in need. We can treat others the way we want to be treated. We can speak out when things are not right. We can send letters to our public officials to let them know we care about the issues. I've been reading an interesting book this past week called The Rage Against God by Peter Hitchens, the brother of, of a famous, famous atheist Christopher Hitchens. Both brothers have become atheists and turned from religion. One brother came back and and saw things that were inconsistent with his atheistic worldview. And, and he actually came to faith. And he talks about some of the events that led to that. And, and he writes about his life as a journalist and the time he spent in the former Soviet Union. He spent about five years there. And he talks about just how far a society can fall when it turns away from God. Even a, a society that claims to pursue equality. When that equality is pursued away from God, it is anything but. And I just want to summarize, this is a really interesting chapter. He says, it was 1990 when the Gorbachev Revolution was approaching its final crisis, and the citizens all knew the daily drudgery of finding anything decent to eat. They knew if they wanted anesthetics <coughs> in the dentist, or antibiotics in the hospital, or cooperation from their child's teacher, or a holiday by the sea, they would need to bribe someone to get it. Fresh eggs were an event. No meant, how much will you pay me? Rats were commonplace. While most struggled to survive, there was a secret elite that enjoyed great privileges, special living spaces, special hospitals with Western drugs and equipment, special schools in which their children were taught English. The elite had privileged access to food, foreign travel, and books. This society, promoted by its leaders as an egalitarian utopia, was in truth one of the most unequal societies on earth. And he says, thanks to, my, the, thanks to the power of hard currency, I lived on the edges of the elite for more than two years. My apartment was unavailable to anyone bereft of power or influence. It possessed 12-foot ceilings, oak floors, uplifting views of the Moscow River on one side and a panorama of the city on the other. My neighborhood included the Brezhnev family and several KGB officials. It exuded power. He says, one night I had been late at a press conference. I had gone by car with a special yellow license plate that marked me out as a foreign correspondent. I normally used the metro, hating the angry, ruthless Moscow traffic and the endless attempts of the traffic police to extort extra big bribes from the rich foreigner, claiming I had jumped red lights or broken speed limits when I hadn't. That night, the police tried to wave me down 200 yards from my building. I was doing nothing wrong, and I ignored them which sometimes worked, this time it didn't. Usually, uh, unusually diligent, they gave chase and followed me into the courtyard. Your papers, they demanded. I gave them to the officer and he tossed them into the slush at my feet, yelling, how dare you drive past our checkpoint when ordered to stop and what are you doing here anyways? He plainly thought I was trying to hide from him and he was preparing to demand an unusually large bribe until I quietly said, I live here. He stiffened and looked suddenly afraid. He picked up my papers and looked again at my passport with its residence permit for that address. He stepped back and mumbled an apology for bothering me and drove away without another word. This sort of privilege was unavailable at home in England, where even members of the royal family were pulled over for speeding. Yet here I was in society, devoted to equality, asserting real rank over an agent of the state. He says, I came to a conclusion that high moral standards cannot be reached or maintained unless understood by an overwhelming number of people. And I have since concluded that a Christian society that's de-Christianized will also face such problems. I have seen public discourtesy and incivility spreading rapidly in my own country. I do not think I would have been half so shocked by the squalor and rudeness of 1990 Moscow if I had not come from a country where Christian forbearance were still established. And then if I had been able to see the London of 2010, 
I lose a deep flu shot. Now that's a powerful picture of how quickly justice can fade from a society when God is abandoned. When the ways of God are, are neglected, society no longer values those same standards. How many generations, we might wonder, would it take for that to become the norm in our society? I mean, he talks about going away and coming back to England and seeing how things have changed in that short amount of time. How many generations away, we wonder, would it take for our society to look like that? Our world is not always just, but believers are called to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Another example of moral decline in a society is religious apostasy. Apostasy means falling away from the truth, turning away from sound doctrine. And we skip down to verse 22. Second Chronicles 28, verse 22. Now in the time of his distress, the same King Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, and said, Because the gods of the kings of Aram helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they became the downfall of him and all Israel. Now the kings were to lead by example. They were to pursue the ways of the Lord. But Ahaz did just the opposite. He abandoned the faith of his fathers and he corrupted Judah's religion. The passage tells us he was impressed by the gods of Damascus. He, he decided to add them to the temple. And the temple was to be a place where the Lord was worshipped. There's one God. The Lord was worshipped there. And yet he brought other gods, pagan gods, into those sacred courtyards. And he thought, well, we've been defeated by the Arameans. Maybe if we worship their gods, we'll be strong. He failed to realize they were weak because they abandoned the God of their fathers, the one true God. And we're given a little more detail of this event, and we won't read the whole section, but in 2 Kings 16, it, it goes into to, to greater detail and, and tells us that Ahaz was traveling to Damascus, and he, and he saw the altar in Damascus, and he, he sent to Uriah the priest a sketch of that altar, which detailed plans for its construction. So Uriah the priest built an altar in accordance with all the plans that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus and finished it before King Ahaz returned. So Ahaz saw this altar, and he was impressed, and so he drew pictures, and he, he took dimensions, and he, he showed how to construct it. He sent it back to the priests. And amazingly, the priests didn't say, hey, this is wrong. We don't do that. There's no other room. There's no room in the temple for other gods. There are no other gods. The priests didn't take a stand. They didn't object. They, they didn't defend the truth, the truth of Scripture. They went right along with the king in his apostasy. They joined in. And before he got back, they had already finished building that pagan altar. And the passage tells us there in 2 Kings that they pushed aside the bronze altar, the altar of the Lord that Solomon had built. They pushed it aside and they put this new altar, the altar to the Damascus gods, in its place. And from that day on, during the reign of Ahaz, that's where the daily sacrifices were made. In the name of those other gods. Now they didn't destroy the bronze altar. In fact, it became the king's personal altar. He went there and used it for his own purposes of divination. He profaned that altar and he, he desecrated God's temple. He tried to mix the religions of the nations with the pure religion of their fathers. It was the same temple, the same priests, the same people but a very different message that was presented. It contradicted the true faith that had been handed down to them. Eventually, we see in our passage, Ahaz would go on to close the doors of the temple altogether. And we wonder, if we look at our world today, how many churches no longer proclaim the faith of our fathers? Same building, same steeple, same stained glass windows, same pulpit, but a very different gospel that's preached. The church is called to influence our culture, but sometimes the culture influences the church so that sound biblical doctrine is replaced and abandoned and, and, and a new message in tune with the ideas of the day are presented instead. 
There's a pressure to conform, to, to align with the attitudes of the world, to change our beliefs, to fit in. And at some point, we might be faced with a decision. Will we act like those priests in the days of Ahaz and go along with the apostasy? Or will we act like the prophets who stood firm and declared the ways of the Lord, even though they suffered the wrath of the king? In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul warns us the difficult days are coming. He looks to the future in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. And he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now Paul doesn't write those words to frighten the people. He doesn't want to discourage the people. He's not trying to incite panic in believers, but he writes this to prepare us and to urge us to remain faithful no matter what may come. Continue to preach the word. Continue to, to endure hardship. Do not stop sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, no matter what may come, but fulfill your ministry. Now this passage helps us to understand the moral decline that we see in history, in the land of Judah. It helps us to understand the moral decline we see in our world, in the world around us today. In some ways, it's a wake-up call that shows us how quickly so the society in which we live can crumble when God is forgotten, when truth is ignored. And, and we could look around in despair and commiserate about the sad state of the world in which we live, but that's not the point. These verses call us to remain faithful no matter what's happening. Do we, as a culture, respect the sanctity of life? Do we practice justice? Do, do our churches hold to sound doctrine? As we see the moral values erode around us, we must not panic, but stand firm. A society without restraint will leave a trail of broken lives, broken men and broken women. But the church needs to be there to offer the healing and the hope of the gospel. We see that here in Judah. People were broken by the ways of Ahaz. Next week we'll see that a new king comes and brings God's word back. And there's healing in the land. A society without moral restraint leaves broken lives in its path. But the church is there to bring the healing and hope of Jesus Christ. So continue living out your faith. Continue sharing the good news. Continue making a difference one part at a time. Father God, as we look at this passage, it's a tough passage to wrestle with. But these are tough things. It's hard to see just the depravity with which, to which Israel had, had sunk in, Judah had sunk in, in those days. And it breaks our heart to think that our world is also in decline. In many ways, we see morality being cast aside, all restraint being thrown off. And, and Lord, we could grumble and be angry and commiserate and, and shake our fists at what we see. But Lord, help us to be compassionate. First of all, stay faithful, stay true to who, you, who you've called us to be, but then to minister to the hurting and the broken all around us. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the redemption that we find in him. Lord, help us to reach out and hold that out to others, to draw others to you. We know that the, the ways of this world will not satisfy, but we have a message that will. So Lord, help us to stay true and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your patience, your forgiveness, and your mercy. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.